So I am going to tell you guys how to save a life today. To start off, let's start with a small story. So I was born with a hole in my heart. Okay. Luckily for me, that hole closed up at the age of five. But some people aren't as lucky as I was. There, there are people who die every single day because of similar issues to mine. In fact, to give you some statistics. 5,000 people, 5,000 people die every single day in India due to a heart attack or a cardiac complication. And the sad part is, 70%, 70% of those deaths are preventable. This is a common scene, right? We're stuck in traffic all the time in Bombay. In fact, I just got my driver's license, so I decided to drive here today. And uh, behind me, I could hear an ambulance whirring away. So I made sure I stopped at the side of the road. People were honking behind me constantly, but I wanted to make sure the ambulance went through. Next thing I know, three taxis come in that same place which I opened up for the ambulance. And as I drove away, I could hear the ambulance beeping and beeping in the traffic. And whenever that happens, I always wonder, are they going to make it? And is the person inside going to survive on time? You know, for that matter, what is the number if you had to call an ambulance today in India? 103. 102, right? And the private number, anyone? 108. Very good. Most people don't know that. And what's the number for the US? 901. It's like <laughs> that we know about the West more than we do about our own country. In the year 2020, India is going to be the youngest country in the world. The youngest. We will have the maximum youth population. In the year 2020, we will also become the world's heart disease capital. We will have over 60% of the world's heart patients in India. The thing is, you don't have to be a doctor to help save a life. There is an easy, very simple way to do it. You don't need to be educated. You don't need to have any kind of special skill except your two hands and the willingness to want to make a difference. And that skill is called CPR. Does anyone know what CPR stands for? So CPR C stands for cardio, P stands for pulmonary, and R stands for resuscitation. Cardio means heart, pulmonary means lungs, and resuscitation means to revive. So essentially, as you can see the little Vodafone Zeus is doing it, um, you are acting as a person's heart and lungs when that person has stopped breathing and their heart has stopped functioning. If your heart and your lungs stop functioning, somebody needs to do its job for it. That is the simplicity of CPR. It is so simple. It is so simple. In fact, anybody can do it. But the sad thing is not enough of us know how to do it. And most people think, oh, CPR was that, you know, that thing I studied in the 10th grade in, you know, in a biology chapter on one page of my ICSC textbook, right? That's that one page where they told us about CPR. In fact, you know, if you follow that, those guidelines on that page, you'll probably end up killing somebody, so I suggest you don't do that. <laughs> Let me tell you a story about one of my friends. Um, she is a couple years younger than me. Came to school one day, her parents both dropped her to school. It was a normal day, you know, everybody was, she had a lovely breakfast, came to school. An hour later, she gets a phone call, which says that her father is on his deathbed. And she must come to the hospital immediately. She had no idea what happened, and she immediately rushed to the hospital. By the time she reached, her father was connected to all the requisite machines, the ventilator. He was alive, but only barely so. Here's what had happened. When her parents dropped her to school, unexpectedly, her father just collapsed in the car. And nobody knew what to do. Luckily, they were very close by to the hospital. But even more luckily, her mother is a flight attendant, and all flight attendants have mandatory training in CPR and first aid. Immediately, her mother started performing CPR on her father. And by the time they reached the hospital, he was able to be saved. The doctor said, if CPR had not been performed on him, he would no longer be there with them today. And Krishna learned the importance of CPR that day. And she said, it's not, it's not one of those things you read about in movies or you watch Mr. Bean where he steps on someone's face and actually, you know, breathes into their chest. It's not. That's not CPR. CPR is a very simple skill, and I'll tell you how simple it is soon. So, in 2013, I founded a campaign called Why CPR. The Y stands for youth, 
and also the question why. And most importantly, why should the youth learn or care about CPR? The aim of this campaign is to create a network of CPR trained and aware youth citizens, and more importantly, people who are empowered and aware how to save a life, and why you should care about doing that at such a young age. Like I said, by the year 2020, we are going to be the youngest country in the world. So doesn't it seem only natural that that sect of the population is empowered with such an important skill? So in order to do CPR, right, I could have said, okay, everybody now practice on your next partner. Unfortunately, we cannot practice on each other. Because if you practice CPR on somebody, you will actually end up stopping their heart, which is already functioning. Hence, we have these special dolls called Anne. The way Anne was created was a very sad, but touching story. In, in the 20th century, there was a French technician whose daughter Anne was swimming in the lake. She was swimming and swimming, and unfortunately, she drowned. Luckily, people saw her. They ran to go save her. But by the time she was pulled out, nobody around knew how to perform CPR. Nobody knew how to save her. And the technician vowed, I will never ever let anybody else go through this again. So using his skills as a technician, he created these specially engineered dolls called ants, christened after the face of his daughter. There's also a rather creepy story about Anne if you want to look that up on the internet. I prefer not to say it here. Um, in any case, you will meet an Anne later. I grew up, I spent the first uh, eight years of my life in the US. And when I was five, my best friend's mother had cancer. And it's not necessarily important because she survived. So it's not a very sad story. But what is sad, or what touched me at that point, was Gracie's mother was beautiful. She had the most gorgeous, long, blonde hair, which used to fall in curls. And I would see her standing in the bathroom crying every time she lost it after chemotherapy. And I'd grown up, you know, hearing social cues, learning that hair is a sign of femininity, something as simple as that. And I said, if, you know, she doesn't have her hair, why can't she have my hair? That was my idea as a little five-year-old. So I used to start donating my hair to an organization called Locks of Love ever since I was five. My hair would grow out and I would donate it for patients to make cancer with. When I moved here, I realized you can do something bigger. So I actually started a... Uh, I started a fundraiser for charity concert, and we raised a lot of money and donated that to the pediatric oncology or cancer ward at a few hospitals in the city. And I realized that is one step to making change. If I can do that, or I can attempt to do that, we can all try to do something to help make that change. Over the years, I started developing my skills. I did a lot of work in anemia and thalassemia, in cardiac disease, organ donation. In fact, so this was, I was uh, 15 years old, and um, I had gone to a conference where the topic forum was human trafficking and organ trafficking. So you'll be surprised to know, any guesses which country has the highest rate of donation per million population? It's not the USA, it's Spain. And that too, it is 36, 34 to 36. That is a very small number, but that is still the highest in the world. Any guesses what India is? Someone said five, it's 0 0.016. 0 0.016 per million population is our rate of donation. And then I said, why? You know, why? What is, what is the issue? Why is this happening? So I started conducting a lot of research into it. And as it turns out, of course, with a lot of things, we had religious, social, economic factors attached to these reasons. I started doing more research. And I decided, let's contact people. So when I was in the US, I said, let's contact the United Network organ for Organ Sharing. And I called them up one day, and I asked them for help. And I was really surprised. They listened, they listened to a 14, 15-year-old, and they said, we will help you. We will connect you to people. When I came back, I tried approaching governmental officials. I tried approaching NGOs. And they said, Aap to saal ke ho. Aapko kya hai? And they, they turned me away. And I said, there has to be something, something that I can do, or something that we all can do to make a difference. And it almost happened by serendipity. So I had gone for my regular health checkup at a community chain of medical centers called HealthSpring. I don't know if you guys have seen HealthSpring around. And in the next room, they were training nurses to do CPR. And I said, wait a second, that, you know, I've seen it on TV. It looks so easy. Why can't I do it? So I went up to them and I said, can you teach me? 
like, uh, sure, you know, we can teach you. I learned it and I realized how simple it is. It is so simple to do, yet barely any of us know how to do it. So that gave me an idea and I said, why don't we try it out at a bigger level, scalable. So I tried it out first. I tried it out first in my school. And uh, we had a wonderfully magnificent response. And I said, one school has such a huge response. Why can't we take it across to all students? And I felt the best thing about taking it to schools, colleges, and other institutions was students want to learn. And not only were we able to teach CPR or able to spread awareness about it, but we were also able to explain the science behind it and why it's being done. Did you know in the West, CPR and first aid are a mandatory part of your general health class? or everybody is required to know about it. If I wanted to go, as somebody who's underage, say I was under 18 and I wanted to go to get myself trained in emergency response, I could do that. But here that doesn't exist. And that doesn't exist for a host of reasons, but we need to create a way to make it accessible. So next step was approaching different institutions. Now the thing about CPR is it's not like, or any skill for that matter, is it's not like I can go and say, hey buddy, I'm just gonna teach you how to do this on this random go because it is, at the end of the day, also a medical skill. And as with any skill, you need to make sure you have the correct quality so that you know how to do it. But once you learn how to do it, for once, the correct way, you know how to do it for life. So I approached several different hospitals, I approached community chains and medical centers, and I partnered with HealthSpring and Indusha Hospital to start this campaign and start this effort. So we currently have about 800 students under the campaign and constantly growing. So HealthSpring is the community medical center, center chain. I'm going to share with you a few ideas which I think make this important as a cause and just as something we should care about. This is a scene of an accident, right? With people actually cheering on during the accident. I feel like this happens all the time in Bombay. It's almost like roadside entertainment. There isn't, there isn't a fence in Bombay. People just stand around and watch what's happening. And nobody steps in to make that change, nobody steps in to help. But I, I actually argue to the contrary. So in psychology, there's a concept called conformity, which essentially means that you act like somebody else, right? As if you're in an army. I think that it takes one person to break that conformity barrier. One person. And why are we all conforming to each other of not taking action? Because none of us really know how to help. Apart from, of course, calling an ambulance or calling a hospital, we don't know how to physically help that person because we've not been educated. We've not been trained. We don't know what to do. That's why it's important that more and more people are educated in this skill, in this life-saving skill. Something like CPR, you don't need to be of a specific age. You don't need to be of a specific background. You can just do it and you can make a difference. You can make a huge help. So as easy as one, two, three. This is how the campaign is structured. Phase one is the training. Training is less than half a day. You and your institution are trained in this basic skill of CPR. Next step is creating leadership. How do you take this forward? How do you show passion about something and take that forward so it spreads like wildfire? I find that whenever the youth cares about something, it spreads like wildfire, which is why we have the burst of social media, burst of all types of technology in this day and age. So step two is creating that leadership. And it's been an amazing experience because there are a lot of kids who are extremely adept with Facebook, who are excellent artists. There are kids who are really, really good at bossing other people around. And all of those skills are being put into use. These translate into marketing operations. Somebody who is a stylist and web designer. Somebody who is head of operations. And people are empowered of actually giving back and caring about something that can potentially help save a life. And phase three is reaching out into your own community. We all have different concepts of community. For me, it could be my building. For you, it could be your karate class. For somebody else, it could be a physical club, like Bombay Gym, CCI, whatever. People take it lightly, but imagine something happens in your building and you know how to do CPR. You can be the person to help save that person's life. Performing CPR increases someone's life expectancy by 40%. So, in conclusion, I'm going to show you a glimpse of our little friend, Anne, and I'm going to show you how simple this skill really is. Now, something that you should know is, to perform CPR, you should keep a song in your mind. It's a famous song by the Bee Gees. Any guesses? 
So it's really adept to the fact. It's called staying alive. Yeah. So staying alive. So what's our normal heart rate? 72 to 80, right? Staying alive is at the beat per minute of about 101, 102 because you're performing it faster so that the blood reaches more spots in the person's body. Just think about it. The time taken to learn CPR is very minimal. The effort exerted is barely anything and the return on investment, right, which we care about so much these days is that you could potentially save a life. So I think it's a very, very important skill and it's a very important passion that people should have about educating each other about things that make them aware. Socially conscious and socially aware. So that being said, can we play the song please? And I will show you a small demonstration of CPR. Unfortunately, I don't have a lapel mic, but this is how we do it. So let's first, let's meet our little friend Anne. Here she is. She comes in many colors, shapes, and sizes. Seating our feet at the back. No, okay, I'll start one second. So this is M. And we are exactly like how a smooth source would be. So can everyone snap to the beat? Okay. So we have a stone quick demonstration. Hello sir, are you okay? You need to check whether the person is just unconscious or intoxicated or actually has a trouble. As soon as you determine that, you immediately go to them. Three steps. Look, listen and feel. You look to see if their chest is heaving or not. You listen to see if they're breathing. And you feel, you feel their pulse. Where do you guys feel to feel the pulse? Okay, some of you are holding out your hand. You don't check on your radio arm. You need to check your heart. Quickly give it a check with one hand. Can you guys all feel your pulse? Yeah, not with both. You look struck with both. Just one hand. <laughs> You need to feel for that. If you don't see any of these signs, you immediately start performing CPR. CPR is 30 compressions, two breaths. That's it. Cycles of that. And of course, the most important thing is you have to call for help so that the person also reaches the hospital. So let's, I'm sorry, let's put the song back. Can we snap? Two. One. You find the point and you start doing the compression. Three times, and then you breathe into the person. Can you see the chest heating up and down in the front? That's it. That is how basic it is. You just need to know the position of the heart and how to breathe into the person. That's it. And that skill can help you. So, 